Praise God, brothers and sisters. We want to thank God for the gift of life. We thank him for his goodness. We thank him for his unending grace, his mercies that never fail. For this far that he has brought us, he has given us a gift of life. He has enabled us really to stand in his presence, to give him all the honor that he deserves. Blessed are we when he calls us to a table where we get together to share of his goodness. I know that while we talk about God together, a few of us or so many of us are blessed to hear from the word of God. And I know there are some of us who hear the word of God and it sounds like news because we read from the books that had never been opened. Not to worry though, I want to encourage you that even personally, there's a time I didn't know how to read the word of God. I am not young, but until at a very later age in my life, God chose me. He gave me a chance to know him and he gave me a chance to talk about him with others. God requires that we love him and having loved him to obey his commands and do the commands of God and teach others to obey and do the will of God. Ezra, for that same reason, he returned to his land to teach the children of Israel the way of God because he had taken all his life trying to learn the word of God and he was perfect at it. While Ezra returned to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Ataxis, Nehemiah, whom we are going to be looking at today, returned in the twentieth year. While Nehemiah came to teach the law to the children of God in Jerusalem, Nehemiah came to do the work of building the temple of God. The two people, all of them, for the same purpose, with different duties and responsibilities. Ezra spent his time in the search of God. He prayed, he fasted, he read the word, and he helped his people to know about God. Nehemiah, on the other side, he prayed, he fasted, he lived according to the will of God, but also pleaded, interceded to God for his people to fulfill his promise. We will remember that during the time of Moses, when God gave his commandment for the children of Israel to be able, just give me a moment, I need to sort something. Thank you. So God, in the covenant he made with Moses, at the time he says that if my people would keep my commandments, I'll bless them beyond measure but just in case they are to deviate from the covenant i will totally destroy them destroy their land and those who will have survived will be scattered in other nations far nations from their homeland but for those who will have survived i will gather them after the land has healed i'll gather them and bring them back to the city, my city, Jerusalem, and I will bless them. From the time of Moses to the time the children of God went into exile, if you look properly, we want to be looking at about 1,000 years. God made the covenant and he fulfilled it at around that same time and so what happens 70 years later in exile because the children of god who knew their god they reviewed the terms of the covenant they lived according to the will of god because they sought him day and night without ceasing and so they knew this fact 
And so we shall see in the book of Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah prayed to God. After getting to know that people that had remained in the land were not living in good conditions at all. And they said to him that the survivors who were left in captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. And that the wall of Jerusalem had been broken down and its gates were burnt in the fire. Nehemiah was so troubled and he wept and he mourned for many days. He prayed, he fasted before the God of heaven and then he he prayed to God and in his prayer he acknowledges the God of heaven a great and awesome God who ha who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him who observes his commandments and so he pleads with him to let his ear be attentive and his eyes open that he may hear the prayer of his servant Nehemiah which he prayed before him day and night on behalf of the children of Israel, his servants. So he confesses the sins of the children of Israel which, who, who had sinned against him. And he reminds them that his fathers and himself had sinned. So he took time to repent in the presence of God. And he reminds God that it was because of their sinfulness that they were banished into exile. But at this point, he also asks God, Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, through some of you, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed. So Nehemiah reminded God over time and again in prayer and fasting that he had promised that if these people who were scattered in further nations would return to him, he would uh, he would gather them from there and bring them back to the place which he had chosen as a dwelling place for himself. And so this is the word that Nehemiah prayed for. And this is what Daniel prayed for. And we see so many people that prayed. Though it's not written down, but we know when we look at the time of um, the, um, Mordecai, all these children of God knew their God. They prayed, they sought God, and they needed their place. Whether in exile or back home, they remained aware of the promise of God. So they knew he would come to their rescue. And indeed, after 70 years, he answered and through Cyrus, that love of God, through Cyrus, they are redeemed. And so we see a group of people who are released by Cyrus. And now we see others who are now released to return home by King Ataxis. And this king is different uh, from King Ataxis. Taxes. I mean, King Zax, who had reigned before, because we see he's the one who authorized the leaders of the people to stop construction of the temple during the, the, the book of, when we were reading the book of Ezra, when there was a point when works were stopped. And that was the husband of Esther. No, the king attacks at first when he was, when you read from verse 4 of Ezra, he first 
stopped the works. But when Darius became king, he resumed the work. So the works during the reign of this particular king, there was a lot of hindrance. So we see Judah now. I mean, Nehemiah in chapter 2, he sent to Judah. Of course, Ju uh, Nehemiah being uh, grieved by the going zone of what the children of God were going through in a season when he was in the presence of God, he was so sad. So one day he goes to serve the king, his tea, his wine, because he was his cup bearer. The king saw he was very sad. And so what he did, he inquired to know what was uh, disturbing his peace because he could see he was not sick. And so Nehemiah confirmed to the king that he could not be happy because his father's house was in desolate state and he needed to be allowed time to go back and reconstruct the temple for his God. And because God had softened the hearts of the king, he asked him, when do you want to go? In the presence of of his wife the queen he allowed him to return and do the work of God and he allowed him to go on his terms and seeing that he had gotten favor before the king he also asked in addition that the king would write for him letters that would enable him to go through the region and not just that but when he returns home that he would be allowed to get timber from the forest. So the letter was written to the one who was in charge of the supervision of the forest, that was Asa, that he would allow him to get timber, timber for his own house, but also for the house of God, and which the king agreed to as well. So Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem, and when he reached in Jerusalem, for three days he did not reveal his reason for coming, and so he went around Jerusalem, and he went with no one, and no horses except the one that he was riding on. And while he was at it, nobody knew what he was up to. I want to think that because he knew his God, he took a moment to possess the land, dedicating it to the Lord that God would give them the land. And once he had finished going around, and he was sure of what he was looking out for, he gathered the people, the children of God that were already in the land, and he spoke to them. And he said, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies west, and its gates are burnt with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken. So Jeremiah, sorry, Nehemiah encouraged his brothers and sisters with what God had told him, but also what the king had told him. So the children of God had two problems at the time, that previously God was not pleased with them and had sent them into captivity, and also, he had allowed the kings of Babylon to do with them anything that they thought was right because they were in captivity. But now, God had removed the reproach and they were free to return home. And he had also softened the hearts of the king and given them before, favor before the king. And as children of God, we need to understand these two things. Whatever we are going through, is it that God has allowed it and that those who uh, ex uh, exhaust, I mean, persecute us, those who exploit us, those who hold us in bondage have also been authorized to do the same? Okay? So we must be able to understand what we are dealing with. If God has allowed it and has allowed the captors to exploit us, it is because we have broken the covenant. 
But if God has not allowed, so if we've broken a covenant, what do we do? We repent. But if the, ex the exploitation we experience has not been allowed by God, then you attack the exploiter with the power of the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. So we must understand, we cannot understand this from the word of God, that the children of God were in exile. And it's different that in Egypt, God had not allowed the exploitation. But in Babylon, God had allowed the exploitation. Because in, in Egypt, God had taken the children of God there to experience the goodness of the Lord because he had prepared a table for them before their enemies. It was after the, the generation that knew Joseph had died that the king that came into force tried to exploit them. So God went forcefully to redeem the children of God and he even judged the gods of Egypt. In the case of Babylon, God had allowed the children to go into captivity because they had sinned, they had defied the covenant. And so it was a reproach that the children of God had brought upon themselves because of disobedience. And it took God to hear the cries of the children of God who repented and he gave them a second chance. And this time he himself revealed himself to the kings and softened their hearts towards his children. So whatever we are dealing with, we must be true to ourselves if we need to heal. Understand what is happening to you. Ask yourself a question. Did you bring it upon yourself or not? If you brought it upon yourself, you will need to walk in the journey that the children of God that were in Babylon walked in. Again, if it was not brought upon you by yourself, and you are very sure that you are held in captivity against your knowledge and, and known wisdom, then there you call upon the fire of God, the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus to redeem you from the covenant you entered in against your will. So God uses different authority. He judges the gods of your captors. He did not judge the gods of Babylon. But as we read the book of Jeremiah, we shall see anyway that Babylon fell into the trap of God because he wanted to destroy them, but the time hadn't come. So he allowed them to fall into the trap when they destroyed his children, the Israelites. God works in mysterious ways. So, chapter uh, chapter 3 of Nehemiah talks about the rebuilding of the wall. So it shows how Nehemiah, after first of all getting into the land, he, he reconstructed, uh, he, he, he moved around the land and repossessed it spiritually in prayer by wherever he stepped, he possessed. And after he had done what he knew God had instructed him to do, he came back and mobilized the people to do the works of construction. When Ezra came back, he started by building an altar for God. And it was from that altar where the people got together and prayed together that they were able to get into the works and progress in the right position. Now, in chapter 3, we see how work was distributed. So what they did, they looked at families that surrounded the walls, and each family was given to construct right in front of their land, where they, they separated, I mean, they were separated from the wall of the church. So each category built from their side. They did not need to gather resources to do the, the works together they just had to allocate sides if you are a neighbor you build the wall next to you 
So people were cooperative. The word of God says that they were a one people in the work of the Lord. And we all know that when children of God have gotten together in agreement, they have gone an extra mile in transforming nations, in changing lives, in installing kings. They did that in the time of David to install him as a king over Israel and Judah. They did that in the construction, repair of the temple. They were a one people. God requires us, like for example, if we are to redeem families from bad foundations, we must be united as a one people. Your hearts must speak the same thing to God. No wonder when we see as nations are not able to break through quickly, it's because we have not been able to stand as a one people. You find all of us saying we are born again, but we cannot agree to do something that benefits the nation because amidst us, the devil has built houses. And while the devil is amidst us, there is no, no agreement. What I've learned over time is that when you see voices not agreeing, just know that there is an enemy in between. So chapter 3 talks about how these families got together to do the works. And so, while these children of God organized, meanwhile, to do the war, the leaders of the land at the time, uh, that is Sanbarat, the Horonite, Tobia, the Ammonite, official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it. They laughed at them and despised them and said, What is this thing you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? But of course, Nehemiah answered them and said, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build but you have no inherit, no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Remember, they first wanted to join them. They were not allowed to join them, so they made fun of them. And yes, always when we have given our lives to Christ, we encounter challenges where people make fun of us. And if you are not strong-willed and rooted in the Lord, you can easily chicken out of the journey that you are embarking on. So it's a reminder to us that whatever we encounter, whatever we are going through, we must remain alert. What we are dealing with, there are already who, people who experienced it and they overcame. The reason we must know the word of God is that it gives us a sense of direction. And I always ask myself a question. So who benefits when we do not know the word of God? The enemy, because he knows that our eyes are blind. And because we do not have knowledge of the word of God, he will lead us in a direction that benefits him. So the leaders of the land made fun of them. And because these people were strong-willed and they knew their God, they knew he would not let them alone because he had shown them that he was with them in a different aspects. So while in chapter 4 we experience the children of God started experiencing um, challenges and attacks from them when they had started rebuilding the wall. And so he was furious. The, the, the San Barat was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the arm of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jew Jews doing with their Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish stones that are burnt? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, even if, if, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone walls. So they continued to make fun of them because they did, they mean they were a, a small group of people, poor, unable to do much. But these people made fun of them. They did not see how they were able to build the wall. But the children of God stood strong, for they cried to God and said, Our God, hear, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to the land of captivity. 
do not cover their iniquity, do not let their sins be blotted out from you from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So why did these people made scorn, poured scorn on them? They made them a laughing stock. They returned all that to God and cried to God because he had instructed the work. God was willing to defend his instruction. And so these people, uh, they tried to come up against them, instituting attacks against them. So what Nehemiah did, he divided the men into two groups. Half of the group provided security for the builders and half of the builders built. The word of God said that each one built with the gun in the left arm and with the wax on the right arm. Um, they did the work of God. It did not move as it was supposed to be moving because half of the men were providing security. They stopped working and started defending the people. And also, what Nehemiah did, he did not allow people to move out of the city because he wanted that those who work during the day, they will protect the people during the night as the night because they worked day and night. So those who worked day shift provided security during the night shift. Those who provided security during the night shift, they provided, they did works during the day. And those who uh, worked, I mean, who provided security during the night worked during the day as well. And so that's how they were able to do it. And they experienced a lot of uh, oppression even among the people the people the children of Israel themselves were beca were had become a pain in the necks of their colleagues they enslaved others they took away their land they were in date and so Nehemiah this is in chapter 5 brought these people and talked to them about letting releasing the children of God out of that bondage and of course he was very angry when he heard the outcry of, the, of these words. And after a, thought, a serious thought, he rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said to them, Each of you is exerting archery from his brother. So he called a great assembly against them. And he said to them, According to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren, who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren, or should you, should they be sold to us? And of course, there was a lot of silence, for they had nothing to say. So they said, What are you what you're doing is not what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God? So he encouraged his brethren to stop enslaving his people, because his people were suffering some farming because they had mortgaged their farms to pay bills so they made a promise to release these people out of date out of enslavement and Nehemiah made them promise not to go back on their word and because they knew the power of the covenant the people complied So Nehemiah was also generous from the time that he was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Xerxes. 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. He always had his people eat on his table. He was generous. He provided and he was very accountable, not like the previous governors. And for this, he cried to God to remember him for his good, for the good he had done according to all he had done to his people. In chapter 6, there is a conspiracy against Nehemiah from Sanbarat, Tobia, Geshom and the Arabs and the rest of the enemies 
who heard that he was building, rebuilding the wall and that there were no bricks left in it. So Sanbarat and Gashom sent for him, saying, Come and we meet together among the valleys, the villages. So they wanted to trap him into disobeying God. But Nehemiah, because the Spirit of God was upon him, he did not fall short of God's glory. So he did not let them take him to the meeting because he knew he sent messengers to them saying, I'm, not, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent him more messages four times and he answered the same manner. Then Sanbarat sent his servant to him as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand and it was written. So they tried to accuse him saying, it is reported among the nations, and Geshom says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king, and you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerns concerning you as Jerusalem, saying there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So they wanted to accuse him that he had declared himself king to make him look bad before the king. But Nehemiah, he sent them saying, no such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they were all trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Now, therefore, O oh God, strengthen. The more they pursued him, the more he prayed. And all this continued, but Nehemiah did not back down. And finally, in the 25th day of Elul, in, the 20, in, 20, in 52 days, the wall was completed. And it happened when all the enemies heard of it, and all the nations around them saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they, they, they perceived that this work was done by God. So after the wall was completed, these people had no explanation instead to just fear the Lord because only God could have done the work. And so the work of God is completed and so in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobia, and the letters of Tobia came to them. For many in Judah were pledge, pledged to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shesha, Shechaniah, the son of Ara, the son of Johan Hanan, had married the daughter of Meshuram, the son of Berechia. Also they reported his good deeds before me and reported my words to him. Tobias sent letters to frighten me to frighten him. Then it was when the wall was built and I had hung the doors, then the gate men, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. And I say to them, do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they stand guard, let them shut their bars, shut and bar the doors and appoint guards from among them. So they protected Jerusalem, like their life depended on it. Anyway, their life depended on it because the inhabitants of the land at the time knew that the tape of the Lord, when it goes up, their lives are not going to be spared. Now, part of chapter 7 talks about the captives who returned to Jerusalem and it gives a greater list of those who returned. And the children of God, finally, back home, the temple of the God constructed and the children of God feel safe that their house 
the house of their God was in place. And that means they could call upon God and God would come to their rescue. So when you, re you add that passage together with the passage of the passages of Ezra, you will realize that God was with his people and he redeemed them from captivity the second time, first from Egypt, second from Babylon. And this is the deliverance that prepares the children of God for the everlasting King, Jesus Christ, who was not going to rule on earth. He was going to rule in the new earth and the new heavens in the new Jerusalem. So what we are seeing is the second deliverance. But after this time, God did not give them a king. So the children of God lived in hope of the Messiah. Unfortunately for them, when the Messiah came, they did not believe him. Because again, God, again, God had opened up to allow all mankind to tap into the goodness of the Lord. He wanted the, all mankind to be saved. He wanted the gift of Jesus Christ as a sacrificial lamb on the altar for his blood to flow for whoever believed in him. Remember, when we read the New Testament, we shall learn the most important aspect that God allowed the children of Israel to, de to deny the Messiah because he wanted the door to be opened for the Gentiles. And until the last Gentile was to be saved, the Jews would remain in rebellion. But remember, to God, the Jews are the firstborns. We are the secondborns. So when the firstborns need something, they take the higher place. We come second in every situation. That is why the life of the Jews is important because the cloak of the Almighty God revolves around them. I don't want to go into so much explanation. My job is to read the Bible with you. You understand the basics, the rest of the explanations and the knowledge. The Holy Spirit will help you, lead you to the Bible reading church, and you will connect with great men and women of God ordained to minister, and they'll teach you more than I can be able to teach you. There is always a place we must begin, and I am giving you a stepping stone to gain the level that will take you into a place of restoration, a place of healing, a place of the mighty power and abundancy of the Almighty God. We are blessed to continue learning of God's goodness. You notice that my videos are coming in a bit late. Those who are expecting them in the morning, there is a little bit of change in my schedule, but I'm fighting to make sure that I get back to my morning routines such that you wake up to the word. Nonetheless, God is fighting to put everything in perspective. And by God's grace, I should be able to get back on my feet as early as tomorrow and the goodness of the Lord will continue to manifest. I thank you for being patient, for watching my videos, for sharing, and God will continue to bless you as you bless others. If the word of God blesses you, share with friends and let your friends hear of the word of God. I know that there was a time I loved God with all my heart, with my mind and my soul, but I did not know his word because I wasn't reading the Bible. And for that, the enemy took advantage of me. The enemy put me in a place of shame. The enemy put me in a place of lack. But I thank God who gave me an opportunity to start reading the word. Out there, there is someone like I was who does not know what God requires from us. We are not limited by the word of God. It is available to those that are willing to learn. Ask God to give you the courage that you need to read his word every day of your life. If you read the Bible every morning, it stashes you into a great day. And you cannot be in a point of lack. God 
is the almighty God. He sits on the throne. He created the heavens and the earth. He has the power. His eyes see every corner of the earth. So why is he not helping you? He's waiting you to call on him. Brethren, right there where you are, call on the Lord. Don't hold back. Cry to him like Nehemiah did. Start reading the word of God. It doesn't matter at what point you stand. Ten chapters every day. In three months, you will be done with the first round. Your life will not be the same again. Do not allow the voice that tries to divert you from the word of God. It is the voice of the enemy who does not want you to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. It's been an amazing time together. Until tomorrow, may God bless you. Have a good night and bye-bye.